Hello. Cool. I'm impressed you came back. How many of you were starting to just a little? Maybe a good time for a nap. This is what I'm asking for. 30 minutes of, whoa, that's much louder. 30 minutes of your time to listen to Simon and I talk about scaling happiness. So this is the title of our talk. What I'm going to be talking about more specifically is my philosophy on work. OK, so a little bit about me first. Um, my name is, is Ben. I'm just scanning down here so I can see my notes. I'm a product manager. My background is in user experience. And then I got an MBA and crossed over to the dark side and got into product. Um, I've worked in services uh, organizations as well as product companies. Um, I recently ran a team that built Puma's um, global technology platform, which was a lot of fun. Before that, I was in startups. And now Simon and I run Vumi, which is an open source mobile messaging platform um, that does some cool stuff. Um, but most important thing for you guys to know about me is I've been working with people like you uh, my whole career, about 10 years. I really like working with developers. I like you guys. You're smart, generally. You can do stuff which most other people can't do, which is cool. You like to build stuff. So do I. Uh, it's a lot of fun. I like working with you guys. So my philosophy on product management is a little different, and it ties into this happiness theme. Okay, My philosophy is that mechanics are secondary. Okay, your roadmap, your functional specs, your tickets, okay, that's on the product side, your technology stack, how many servers you've got up and running, how much they cost, how you're doing caching. That's all really important, don't get me wrong, but it's secondary. Most important thing is the team dynamic, okay? If you get the team dynamic right, everything after that's gravy. Things just work. But what I focus on as a product manager is how do I get the team dynamic right so that we can build cool stuff. So I think there, as a, as a product manager, I think there are uh, three things in order to get the team dynamic right. And again, you get the team dynamic right, the product happens properly. Okay, the first one's great people. The second one is helping those people be rightly related to each other. And the third one is creating space. Okay, we're going to talk through all three of these, uh, one at a time, obviously. So first, let's talk about people. Okay, why are people important? People are important because robots can't yet, okay? Robots can't. The people are the ones who are doing the building, okay? When you're huddled around a whiteboard making design decisions, it's people next to you who you are conversing with. When you're trying to figure out a pricing model and how you're going to charge customers and how much that's going to be, it's people who are going to have those opinions. When you've written um, something, a service, and you're up for your code review, it's people who are reviewing your code telling you to do it over, all right? When you walk into the office, it's that guy you're going to see. And when you go home at night grumbling, it's about that guy. People are important because they are what constitute uh, a team. The second reason people are important, in my opinion, is because people are complex. We are complex. This isn't a room full of developers, it's a room full of human beings. And human beings have history, uh, they have knowledge, uh, they have experience. And they're bringing all that to the table. You're not hiring a developer, you're not hiring one of my favorite descriptions, a coder, 
No, you're hiring human beings. Your team is made up of human beings, and those human beings are complex. So it's really important to get the right people. So how do you recruit? How do you find, well, these are my thoughts on how you get the right people on your team. You want to invest more upfront. Because once the person's on your team and you realize it's not the right fit, it's a much harder position to be in, OK? This is, well, this is how you don't recruit. You don't look at the CV, and if you do what I do, skip to page five and compare your matric results to theirs. You don't just read the CV and interview them for an hour. You bring them into the office. I really like pair programming for half a day on a specific thing. See how they work. Get them in for lunch. See how they are in a team setting. If you're interviewing, don't ask the question, so what are you interested in? Put them in a situation. Ask them, tell me about a time when your manager asked you to do something that you inherently knew was wrong. What did you do? Explain to me the situation, how you acted, and what the result was. That's a different kind of question. Okay? It really tells you, it gives you more insight into who this person is. Okay? The third thing I believe in is you want to ask the community. Okay, I had an HR manager tell me once, well, I asked her, why don't you do references? And she said, ah, because the person will just lie. I mean, the, the, the candidate you know, chose the person who they're asking you to talk to, and that person is obviously going to give a glowing reference. And I disagree. If somebody asks me for a reference, I tell them the truth, you know? Because the amount of expense and time invested in somebody, it's a lot. It's very expensive. Ask the community. And a good HR manager will know when they're being BS'd or not. Okay? And you don't just have to ask the references. Ask people in the community who you know they've worked with. Do your homework. Make sure you're getting the right person onto the team. And my last point here for people is coaching. Okay? Especially with uh, younger uh, recruits, but not just uh, folks right out of college. Coaching. So here's an example of that. A couple of years ago, um, working on the Puma account, we hired a PM right out of college. She was very smart. She wasn't technical. So for the first six weeks, she couldn't talk to the client. She didn't work with the team. She worked through a manual, and she learned how to code. She wasn't very happy with me about it. She did it. Once she had learned how to code, she read through the manual on our application. So she really understood how our technology worked. And by the end of the six weeks, she was empowered. The client trusted her, and our team trusted her. She did an amazing job, 22 years old, but she was coached. So it's important to coach your team, not just with skills, but also interpersonal stuff, um, which is what I'm going to talk about next. Rightly related. OK, now things get hairy. Okay, this is hard, in my opinion, and in my experience, it's hard. It's the secret sauce. It's the X factor. It's the most important thing. What is rightly related? Rightly related is the ability for a team to work through stuff. Hard things, disagreements, fights, niggle. That's where you want to get to with your team, the ability to do that. Uh, it's important because we don't work in isolation. I'm pretty sure all of you work on a team in some form or another. We are the sum, or we're hopefully greater than the sum of our parts. A team only works if it's working well together, okay? The end goal of a team being rightly related is what I call ease, okay? Flow. When you've got flow on a team, when you've got ease on a team, Things happen easily. Conversations flow, okay? Conversations uh, have an endpoint that's positive, okay? Uh, flow and rightly related teams don't avoid disagreement and conflict. They invite it. Conflict and disagreement is good. The point you want to get to in your team is when you can invite conflict, invite disagreement, and work through it. Have the confidence to go into it, knowing that you'll come out the other side. The only way to do it is to get into those types of conversations and figure it out together. It's a little scary, but it's really important. So how 
do you get your team to be rightly related? Okay, the first one is, you gotta own your stuff. We've all got stuff. We've all got baggage, okay? Being good at maths in high school was not cool, okay? What was cool was being the captain of the first rugby team or being the head boy, okay? We have a responsibility to our teammates and to our team to own our stuff, to work through our issues, and have enough self-awareness to know how am I contributing positively to the team, what am I giving, and what am I taking away, and doing your best to work through the stuff that you're taking away. I personally think everyone should sit down with a therapist at one point in their life. <laughs> uh, everyone's got baggage. You've got to work through it. The second point here is this idea of empathy, okay? Empathy is the ability to understand where somebody is coming from. If someone's being a jerk, why? You know, if someone's really disagreeing with something, why? Try and understand where that person um, is coming from. Uh, I worked on a team a couple of years ago where someone was really good at listening. She would listen and then she would ask a question based on what you just said. How novel. We need more of that. We need to listen to what people are saying. Put your agenda aside and then ask a follow-up question. Okay? The way to do that is to have empathy, to really want to understand where this person's coming from. Okay? Have awkward conversations we've talked about, who I touched on briefly. But the idea there is you want to go into a con <laughs> Here's the situation. You have a conversation which you're scared of. At least this is my experience. Because I don't know how it's going to turn out. It could go really, really badly. You want to head into that conversation. It gets easier the next time with practice. Have those awkward conversations. And the last thing is, sometimes you've got to switch people out. You just do. And it sucks. But sometimes you have to. OK. Um, my example for this is, as a product manager, I like to think of my products as people. I give them names. Uh, in user experience design, the idea is personas, right? Similar kind of thing. You need to do, what's be ultimately, what's best for your product. She or he, whatever gender you give your product, yes, this is getting a little weird, uh, she doesn't have a voice of her own. You have to be the voice for your product, okay? And sometimes that means switching people out. On that cheery note, let's talk about space. So, this is the third point. We've gone through two. This is the last one. My philosophy is get the right people, help them be rightly related, and then get out of the way. If you've got the right people and they know how to work with each other, your job is pretty much done. You don't have to stick in there and get in their way. Why is space important? Because we, as creative people, as builders, need freedom to think, to create, to explore, to daydream. Okay, that's part of the creative process. That's part of the building process, time to think. A couple of months ago, I sat down with two founders of uh, an agency in the States. Nice guys, do fantastic work, very successful. Mm. They want to build products. They want to diversify. They love building stuff for clients, but they want to build products. And they said, Ben, we've got this great opportunity. Our team is 65% utilized. That means 65% of their team's total working hours in the year was, were billable. It's actually really high for an agency. They said, hey, we've got 35% of our team's hours available. Think of the cool stuff we could build. I mean, that's over 50 people. That's a lot of hours, okay? But they were forgetting one thing. You need slack. You need space to think, okay? I'm looking behind me because I can't see my notes on the computer. I'm not interested in 40 hours of a developer's time. Don't care. I'm interested in a developer's attention. I want your headspace. 
I want you, when you're in the shower at night or going for a run or walking the dog, I want you thinking about the product, okay? How do you put that in a timesheet, okay? Creativity cannot be time boxed. You gotta create space for your team to do amazing stuff. Okay, how do you create space? I'm gonna get a little businessy here and say, I really like accounting. Accounting's fun. You can be creative with accounting, and you can be creative and abide by the laws of the land. <laughs> uh, you can use accounting to create space for your team through this thing called financial margin, okay? Financial margin is revenue, take out your variable costs, and what you've got left is margin from which you pay salaries. You can get creative with your financial margin. So, the story I told a couple minutes ago about those two guys, the founder of the agency, they decided, no, we're not just gonna cherry pick people's hours and actually have this huge context switching problem. Instead, we're gonna take last year's margin and put two people dedicated to a product for a year next year in 2015. What a fantastic decision. They're using their financial margin to create the right environment where a great product can be built. At Breakout, we do something similar. Uh, we sign up clients for projects and then we use dev partners to do the, the actual uh, uh, client application, freeing up our core team to build the platform. There's margin there between what the clients pay and what we pay our dev partners that enable us to hire a team to work dedicated on the product. The other interesting um, way to use margin is through grants versus venture capital. Okay, with a grant, there are different strings attached. With a venture capitalist, there's a return on an investment. And they're intense. There's some good ones, but those guys are intense. So that's the first way you create space is through using financial margin. The other way is you need, in order to have space, you've got to have a dedicated team. Okay. Um, and you need to uh, protect that team from distractions. Okay, so recently I had my review at Prykelt, where I work, and somebody within the company, bless him, said, you know, Ben thinks his product is more important than my projects. And I said, yes, it is. Stay away from my guys, okay? That's the mentality you have, you need to have, uh, in terms of your team and protecting their time. Um, and that plays into deflecting distractions as well. You gotta protect your guys. And lastly, the onus is on you to own your time. If the first thing you're doing in the morning is checking your email, you're doing it wrong. Turn off your email, check it at noon, check it again at five if you want, sign out a chat, create, own your schedule, own your time, uh, so that you have time to build stuff. Okay, my last slide is in closing, before I hand to Simon. When I was, uh, just finished my trick, despite my American accent, I went to school here, uh, I went to the States to play golf. I was gonna become a professional golfer, make a ton of money, <laughs> live the good life. Except, professional golf is really boring. Uh, yeah. You're basically on the driving range all day hitting a golf ball. You're relating to yourself. And I missed people. I wanted to be part of a team. I wanted to work with people to build cool stuff. Similarly, my father-in-law is one of the top hotel, administra uh, hotel hospital administrators in the States. Okay, he works hard. He gets up at 4.30. He works till 7, Monday through Friday and Saturday. But all he wants to really do, or when he's most happiest, is, with the, is when he's with his grandchildren. Man, he loves being with his grandchildren. My point is this. As a developer, the most important thing you can do, in my opinion, is not choose the right technology stack or architecture application in such a way that it can scale to 100 million users. That stuff's important. But the most important thing you can do is invest in the person sitting next to you. Thanks. I'm going to hand to Simon. How do I get something slide? Sure. 
Hi. So you may be wondering what queuing theory has to do with your happiness, but if you'll bear with me for a few minutes, um, we'll find out. Um, okay, ben is busy connecting the mouse. Um, cool. So I'm going to start with um, just the concept of 20% time. So many of you will know that for a long time Google had internally this big, um, big thing that all developers would have 20% of their time to work on their own projects. And Google's a big company and they have a reputation for being very data driven, whether or not that's true is a matter of opinion. So people looked at this and went, why are they spending 20% of their development time on, well, on, on nothing? And Ben's just touched on this already with his um, this kind of story about the advertising agent, well, about the agency, which had 35% spare capacity. Um, and I'm going to kind of dive into some thoughts about why you might actually want to have why 20% may actually be a kind of minimum amount of spare capacity that you want. And now I have to switch over to something which is not Keynote. Okay, okay great. Um, except this one has nothing to do with my talk. <laughs> um. Okay, so I want to start by just thinking about kind of utilization. So if you as a team have, say, 100% capacity, um, what we mean by 20% time is that you're only already utilizing on average 80% of of this time. Um, and this concept of utilization is going to be very important in the next few slides. So let's see what happens when work comes in. Um, okay, so you can think of kind of work for your team to do as coming in from all kinds of different places. Um, in our case, it's largely client projects, but they're also internal things. Um, so there'll be some internal projects that we want people to work on or there'll be a problem in production which suddenly needs hours spent on it. Um, so tasks, so these bars here are tasks and there's time along the bottom axis and then size of task along the vertical axis. And I just wanted to kind of show this to get people the idea of what this process looks like. So somewhere um, we have a team working on things and these tasks are kind of arriving and sometimes the tasks are small, like the one on the right. Sometimes they're bigger, like the one on the left. Oh, sorry, like the one in the middle. And sometimes they're kind of medium-sized. And both the sizes of the tasks and the time between them varies. So, um, and these numbers are going to be, be important later. So the, the size of the task um, is, so the task will have an average size, um, which will be important. And then tasks will also have a kind of variance, and that variance is going to be very important in determining things. Now, one question that kind of you can ask yourself is, when new work comes in, how long is it going to take before someone starts working on that? So what's the average wait time before a job gets kind of can be worked on? And so now I'll kind of answer that question. Um, so, there was some work done in the 60s um, by a researcher named Kingman, and he actually solved completely generally the average wait time problem for queuing. So, if you have some probability distribution for the sizes of your tasks and the um, differences in arrival times, he worked out exactly what the wait time would be. So, this is an actual formula if you know those numbers, if you know the average size of your task, if you know the variance in task size and wait times, you can actually plug these numbers in and get real numbers out. And the graph you get is the one I've shown here. So what we're looking at is 
On the bottom is utilization, so that's a fraction between zero and one of how much of your time you're using. And on the vertical axis is wait time. So the units of the vertical axis are, um, well, so imagine that our units for the size of our task is one week, then the vertical axis has kind of, is, is also in weeks. So if you look at things at the moment now, and let me just see if I can move the mouse into position. Can someone tell me if that's about 80%? Yeah, so you can see that if we have 80% utilization, the waiting time for a task to start is on average four weeks. So um, I think that's kind of acceptable, at least our clients, I can probably see us saying, we can start it next month and they'll be happy. Of course, something to remember here, this is the average time. This is not the worst case scenario. This is what things are gonna be like, like on average. Now, this formula, interestingly, is dependent on the size of the task. So let's say that on average we get from our clients a, um, a, a one-week project, then we'll have to wait four weeks. But if on average we get a one-month project, we'll have to wait four months. So, and obviously then clients are going to be less happy. So this leads to kind of the first lesson is that you can reduce the time that things wait in the queue by reducing the size of your tasks. So obviously in software development, there's a kind of minimum task size that's, that's useful. I mean, you can't, well, some developers I've met actually can do this, but it's very hard to sit down and do productive work on something for an hour. Um, so probably for development, probably something like a week or a few days is a sensible kind of minimum task size. It depends a bit what's being worked on. The other interesting thing though is, so if you look at the parameters on the right, tau is the task size, which I just spoke about. Um, CA is the coefficient of variation for the arrival times. So for the arrival times, the waiting time is actually proportional to the square of that variance. So if we double the variance, the queue gets, f the average waiting time gets four times worse. Um, I'm not sure how we're going to be able to see this, but so if you start dragging this up, you can see the, the horizontal, so the vertical axis rescaling itself quite rapidly. Um, so if you can make your tasks arrive more consistently um, and for more consistent time gaps, you can actually reduce the waiting time in the queue. And the same is true for the next one, which is the variation in task size. So if you can somehow estimate well and divide up your tasks into even chunks, you can reduce the size of that queue. Now, I think the size of the queue is strongly related to developer happiness. <laughs> at least for me personally, looking at the kind of backlog and going, there's a year's work of work here um, before we get all of the things that we think we should be doing done, that's pretty demoralizing. Um, so, so what can we, <laughs> what can, so what does this tell us about 20% time? So there's a couple of things which are important here. Scheduling your 20% time is a complete failure because what we need from this 20% is slack time and that's slack time from the perception of, of things being scheduled. So you can do anything you like in your slack time as long as you can drop it straight away when a task arrives and pick it up straight away. So that's a fairly strong criteria for dev work. Um, again, it depends a bit on individual devs, but whatever you're doing in your 20% time needs to be something that you can pick up and drop easily. Um, yeah, so if you're going to give people 20% time, don't schedule anything on it. Um, Google was meant to always be on a Friday. Um, if they actually enforced that, that would be a complete failure. Maybe that's why they dropped it, I think, at some point. Um, but yeah, so it, it needs to be time which can be anywhere. Oh, um, so if you have a giant backlog, um, there's what, what can you do? Um, because <laughs> I think a lot of us have been in a position where there is a huge backlog. Um, so the one thing you can do is just throw tasks away. And I don't mean putting them onto some other backlog which you'll get to eventually. If your, if your queue is kind of large, especially if your utilization gets kind of really high, um, 
you're never going to get to those tasks, or at least they're so far away that kind of your life and your product and the world may have entirely changed before you get there. So you need to be prepared to throw tasks away. Um, the other solution that you can use is to temporarily increase capacity. Um, this is kind of tricky. We all know about the mythical man month. Um, at Precult, we do this somewhat successfully by giving work to people like Mike. Um, and that does work, but it's not a, a pure win. There's um, obviously there's overhead involved in kind of shuffling work around like that. Um, cool. So I think I've talked a bit about kind of sort of in general like doing work. Um, now I'm going to kind of look at what kind of work we do, and I'm going to divide it up into some categories. Um, so I think the kind of work that I do, if I think about my day, is divided up into four main kinds. And this is maybe not an accurate representation of the usual breakdown, but we'll get back to that in a second. So there's work that's required, and this is really kind of a client request comes in, or some internal project has to be worked on, and this is making something which will be accepted by the client, or will be accepted by the other people in the company. And then there's, kind of on top of that, professionalism. So this is doing stuff well, doing stuff that maybe the client won't notice right now, but someone will notice that in sort of three months' time that you had good test coverage and you ironed out those bugs that QA didn't pick up, um, or you've put a bit of thought into scaling the system so that when suddenly the users increase by an order of magnitude, even if stuff falls over, it's at least fixable um, without completely rewriting things. Um, then there's a tiny bit of time which I call awesome. And this is really what Ben was talking about when he was talking about making space for creating stuff. So the time in which you get to do awesome is, I think, in many ways, the most valuable time. Um, and it's valuable for two reasons. One, I think that we all get made happy by doing awesome things. Um, if you do something well, or you come up with a great solution, or you make a client really happy, or you make a colleague really happy, that gives you a sense of kind of um, a, a sense of value. Um, people speak about autonomy, mastery, purpose, and I think awesomeness <laughs> encompasses all three of those. Um, you're generally autonomous because you're kind of free to create whatever you feel is valuable. Um, it's showing mastery because you're doing something well, and it's showing purpose because you're developing something that someone else kind of needs. Um, the last little category, uh, hello? <laughs> Fire, yes. Uh, do, I, do I do this? Oh, Ben, it needs your password. <laughs> um, so Fire is ready, um, which we're going to get to in a second, is a very dangerous category. And it's very dangerous because um, when you think about it, the number of fires that are breaking out are actually related to, I think, the amount of professionalism and awesomeness you're getting to do in a negative way. So, well, in a, well, a good direction, but kind of more professionalism and more awesome results in fewer fires. Um, and especially with awesome. Awesome is that project that a dev writes in a couple of weeks, which a decade later is still running and no one ever has to look at it. Um, Professionalism helps, uh, but only, uh, only a bit. It's really awesome, which kind of prevents sort of, it's the neat solution which prevents all kinds of problems because they just simply don't arise um, with this neat solution. Required, I think, actually adds to fires. Um, the more kind of work you're doing that where you're putting in the minimum amount of work necessary, the kind of worse things are going to be. So I've kind of jiggled things here to show you what I think happens. So let's say that your company doesn't have a great financial margin and you find the need to bring in more work. So what happens is that required kind of grows. And now awesome is looking really tiny. And then it grows some more and then awesome is gone. So awesome is the first thing that gets sacrificed. And that's why we have to fight to protect it as hard as we do. Um, and now for the really bad, bad, bad thing, which is that after the awesome is gone, everything kind of looks okay. People are working hard, you're doing a professional job, but a couple of weeks down the line, something which could have been prevented by awesome causes a fire. And now some of 
professionalism is being eaten because the load is still the same. And so more fires break out. And then more fires break out. And eventually, things get so bad that the fire just runs away. And um, yeah, and this, this point is really bad, the point where you stop being able to do the required work. If you hit this point, basically, your business is going under because you were taking on that required work because you had a financial need. And now, not having enough awesome means that um, you are no longer actually able to even do the work that you need um, to make money. And that's it from me. I don't know if Ben has any closing stuff. Oh, uh, questions. Cool. We can take questions for both both sections. People awesome and okay. the maths of awesome. Ben, you have to get up here to answer questions. <laughs> I'm not sure who's going to answer it, but um, one of the things that I've noticed with, with some people is that um, they work best under pressure. Sometimes they like to be under pressure, and when they're under pressure and they, they save the day, that is when they produce their best work. So these sound like professional firefighters. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think uh, what we also strive to do, to, you, to your point, is uh, match roles to what people are excited about. So we do have some folks who are better at those situations, and, but we have other folks who those types of situations r really freak them out. Um, so we try and do that match as best we can. But I do agree that there are people who, who actually thrive under those types of situations. Yeah, and I think if you can have dedicated firefighters, that is a kind of way of getting slack. I mean, I guess this is why a lot of large organizations have kind of quite large firefighting teams, I think, um, or at least young devs should get to work long hours. <laughs> um, yeah, but I think it's, if people are happy in their roles, it's great. Okay, so on the last thing, I think some firefighters are also arsonists. <laughs> um, so question for, for Ben. I thought that was completely awesome. Thank you. And uh, I want to ask you, what's one book that you would recommend to the audience to read? a good question. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to have to think about that and get back to you. I'm sorry, nothing really pops into my head right now. That's a really lame answer, but it's kind of true. Any other? Simon has an answer. That, that, that's the question of the day so far, given that it stumped you. Yes. <laughs> so if there's one thing you're going to read, that I would recommend, and this is very much coming from my side of the talk. Um, there's a book called The Mathematical Theory of Communication. Um, it's by Shannon and Weaver. And the first part by, is by Weaver, who's a journalist. Shannon's a mathematician. And the introduction to that has really changed how I see communication um, between people. So it's like 30 pages. I would really recommend it. He used this. Yes. <laughs> what did he say? Oh, we hiring. It works for me. It doesn't work for him. Yeah. Uh, it's my magnetic force. He said, "Are you hiring?" And you said, "Yes." <laughs> Any other questions? So maybe we can expand that a little. We're hiring all sorts of people. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Can I give a book recommendation? Delivering Happiness is an awesome book about happiness culture. It's uh, from the guys uh, from Zappos, Tony Shea. It's a really good book about uh, liberating people to do awesome things. I'll think of one. Don't worry. I'll think of one. I'll find you later. <laughs> the phone book's quite interesting, too. So, uh what can you as a dev do to prevent going into that fire mode? Uh, you know, it seems to be dictated by financial stuff and things like that. 
So I think the first thing you can do is not consider financial stuff to be someone else's problem, at least not entirely. Um, where if you're on a team, you're really on, on a team and you need to show some consideration for the problems that other people are facing. Um, yeah, so if they're financial problems, um, you need to take an interest because it's going to affect your happiness in, in the long run. I don't know if Ben has more to add. Did you ride your own horse? <laughs> I assume that's directed at me, and the answer is no. <laughs> but I can recommend the Volvo C30 if anyone. 